Hi, and welcome to uh, your first lecture for week five of Survey of Chinese Art. This week we are going to be looking at a period of time known as the Six Dynasties. And uh, I, call, I just put it under the rubric Six Dynasties, and that's what a lot of people do, because there's actually tons and tons of little kingdoms that control smaller parts of China and war with each other during this period. So for the predominant part of, it's from the end of the Han, uh, onward, there it's sort of like the Dark Ages in Europe, where you have this kind of, you know, you have this great empire that collapsed, and then you have regional powers competing for control during this period. So for most of the six dynasties, that's what's going on politically. We're going to look at the reemergence of a stable and fairly geographically widespread kingdom uh, later on in the so-called six dynasties period. It's a a smaller region than the entire geography of China, but it's a dynasty known as the Northern Wei, and uh, w the Northern Wei, W-E-I. And in the Northern Wei, one of the things that happens is we see the kind of crystallization of Buddhism becoming not just something that's brought in from the Silk Roads, but like a, a really major cultural force in that part of China. And what we'll look at today is the first manifestations of that in Chinese art, which really is in these giant rock-cut temples that we'll see uh, today. So let's see, and what, what I have to say generally about the Six Dynasties period is that, as I was saying, it's a period of a lot of disunity and strife and conflict between different, um, different regional kingdoms that is goes on for a good period of time, a couple hundred years, and in the next slide we'll actually show you the list of dynasties. Uh, the other thing that characterizes this period is the introduction of Buddhism from the West on the Silk Roads. Buddhism, as you will know from reading the, um, the readings that I've assigned to you, originated in, in India with the life of the historical figure of the Buddha in the 6th century BCE. Now, that's the 6th century BCE when Buddha lives, and then his followers begin to elaborate uh, the beliefs of Buddhism in the ensuing um, uh, centuries. By the time Buddhism really starts to make its way eastward from India into China, it is a major religious and cultural force that's been around for several hundred years and has developed into various interpretive approaches to the basic sort of um, ideas of Buddhism. It is a complex set of, or it's a complex religion, much the way that you have in Christianity different interpretations, you know, different emphases that are placed on different parts of the scripture and different parts of the life of Jesus. Um, and different parts of the sort of tradition that's accreted around the original figure, historical figure of Jesus. Same thing going on with Buddhism. As you'll know, there's the greater vehicle and the lesser vehicle, so one being more sort of direct experience of Buddha, and then the other being more centered on having a uh, hierarchy of priests and monks and things like that who are the, um, you know, intermediaries between us and Buddha. Say, I mean, a little bit of the same thing goes on in, in Christianity as well. Anyway, that's for you to read about. I'm not going to lecture about that too much. What I'm going to show you is the art that emerges during this early period when Buddhism takes hold and then becomes adopted by, in the case of the Northern Way, towards the end of the Six Dynasties, it becomes adopted by the rulers of the Northern Way, and then it becomes an integral part of the political structure just as much as Confucianism had been or Taoism had been in the Han Dynasty. And now those earlier teachings do not go away, by the way. So we will continue to see Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, filial piety, um, oftentimes in the same monuments even. But right now today we're going to look at Buddhism. So this week, here's a map of what we're doing the next couple of weeks. The Six Dynasties period, particularly the late Six Dynasties period, is just as as the Northern Way unifies things, this period of incredible imperial patronage of the arts and an incredible kind of rebirth of all sorts of, uh, or, or birth of all sorts of painting and calligraphy and things like that. So it's a really fertile period that lays the groundwork for what will happen with 
the golden age of China in the Tang Dynasty and the Sung Dynasty. So today and the next lecture this week, we're going to focus on Buddhism as it emerges in the Six Dynasties period in Chinese art. Next week, we're going to look at calligraphy and painting and how those manifest, those two very important parts of the Chinese art tradition really appear I mean, they've been around for a while, but they really, we have a lot of information about how they're developing from the six dynasties on. And so that's what we'll be looking at next week is calligraphy and painting. Here's just your roadmap of the six dynasties in this period of time from the end of the Han to um, essentially, there's a short-lived dynasty called the Sui, and then the Tang comes along after that. So in this interregnum of the six dynasties, you can see there's more than actually six dynasties. There's a period of the Three Kingdoms, the Jin Dynasty, which is also divided into a Western and Eastern. Uh, and again, those names really come from where the capital is during that particular reign. Uh, and the Western Jin further divided into 16 kingdoms, right? And then the Southern and Northern Dynasties. It's the Southern and Northern Dynasties period where things start to slow down and where the Northern Way emerges. The Northern Way was around from the no, from the late 3rd century on, but they really take control of a large amount of territory in 489, and so they become a, a predominant power then. So, as I've labeled slides for this lecture, a lot of them will say they are Northern Way because they come from this late period, and most of the art, the Buddhist art that we'll be looking at, starts with the Northern Way or later. I just wanted you to be aware of the umbrella term for this period is the six dynasties because it's incredibly complex how many dynasties in different regions there are. For my purposes, if you know the six dynasties and then if you know the northern way uh, and you know that these are somewhat somewhat interchangeable um, and can identify things as northern way or six dynasties on the, on the exam, then that will be enough for me. Here's just a map showing you the territory of North uh, East China that was under the control of the Northern Way. And then I've got an arrow pointing there to the city of Luoyang, which is where, uh, or is about the site of the, some of, the, it's the later part of the Northern Way's capital. And there will be some important grottos there. So I just wanted to get you a little bit oriented to what we're talking about geographically. Here is a rudimentary map of the Silk Roads of trade across um, across the Middle East and um, India and into China. So this is the, I, I borrowed this map off the web and it's a, the Silk Roads are actually skewed a little bit farther north than they should be. But I just wanted to show you, there I've got an arrow pointing to Luoyang, which is that capital city that I was showing you of the Northern Way. The other place that we're going to look at is farther west on the Silk Road, a place called Dunhuang, <clears throat> which is filled with all kinds of interesting Buddhist art. Um, but this is the trade route that develops between China and the silk industry of China and the west. Um, China <clears throat> trades with India, which trades with the Middle East, which trades with Rome, which trades with Europe. Um, and after the fall of the Roman Empire, I mean, trades with Europe. So the Silk Roads exist across this massive part of the world for several centuries, and people go back and forth across this part of the world trading goods between China and the West and stops in between. And even, you know, some of the places that are in the news a lot right now, like in Afghanistan, Kandahar, uh, and parts of uh, Iraq, were cities that developed along the Silk Roads, you know, they developed as trading posts along the uh, Silk Roads. And it's that route that not only brings goods from one place to another, but also people, ideas, religious beliefs, art, habits of thinking, and things like that. So it's really because of the Silk Road trade that we get the, the introduction of Buddhism farther and farther east into, into China proper. And here I'm just showing you a site, or just sort of so you can see there, um, if you drew dots between Kashgar, Turfan, Dunhuang, Datong, um, Luoyang, you'd have, or in Xi'an, you'd have parts of the Silk Road mapped out here. So I've got in red dots there the two sites of the caves that we're going to look at that have 
Buddhist statues in them. Yungang is the earlier one from the earlier part of the Northern Way, and Longmen is uh, later on. So here, <clears throat> again, along the Silk Roads at this early site of the capital of the Northern Way, we have the emergence of caves and grottos dedicated to the worship of Buddha and dedicated to the practice of Buddhism. These are actually uh, sponsored by the emperors of the Northern Way who are in um, a position to not only fund and pay for massive large-scale sculpture, but also seem to recognize that in the region that they live in, because Buddhism is becoming so popular, it is a smart political maneuver to embrace Buddhism and make it the official state religion. So, um, not to say that the emperors of the Northern Way didn't believe in Buddhism or that they were just cynical, but these things actually, for most of human history, tend to go hand in hand. Religion and politics, um, it's actually quite a radical idea in American history to try to separate the two. Um, and at this point, religion and politics are not really separate. So we're going to talk a little bit. There are caves, or you can see there in this slide, there are caves all along this cliff face at Yungang, where there are basically versions of the, or, you know, statues of the Buddha and his attendant bodhisattvas and things like that, that people paid for and had put up here to help to kind of, um, um, first of all, showcase their own piety to also kind of get in good with the emperors of the Northern Way and also, of course, to practice their beliefs. Uh, the largest of these, though, is the statue or the set of statues actually commissioned by the emperors themselves, the, the ruling house of the Northern Way dynasty. So there you can see the colossal Buddha cut into the, the art, historical, art historical term for this is cut into the living rock because of course, this is a um, <clears throat> cliff face, and the statue has been carved in situ and not removed and taken out and made into a sculpture in a museum or temple or something like that. So carved into the rock face, carved into the living rock. There's another view of some of the side grottos at Yungang, so you can see the scale of this project, not only of the smaller caves, but then it gives you a little bit of a sense of how massive the Yungang construction is itself. It's something like... I think it's about 14 meters, which means what? 42 feet tall, roughly. And there you can see in this view, um, they're man-made caves carved into the side of this uh, cliff face, and then inside the there are many, many different Buddhas. And this actually kind of goes along with one of the motifs of Buddhist art is this whole idea, and of Buddhism itself, is in some versions of Buddhism, there's a belief in multiple Buddhas. and Buddhas that have different aspect of the historical Buddhahood, uh, or of the historical Buddha. So there's the historical figure of the Buddha, known as Shakyamuni, who was the prince who left his home, went out in the world, realized that there was suffering, wanted to do something to um, cope with that fact, and then came up with the whole idea of the path towards nirvana, the Eightfold Path. And again, you will have read about this in your readings, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But here, uh, it, it, over time, there developed lots of schools of thought about Buddha that, you know, that he had different manifestations, um, different aspects of the Buddha that were celebrated or worshipped by different um, approaches to Buddhism. And that's kind of what's being represented here in this kind of thousand Buddhas uh, in the thousand caves. Okay, so here is the main cave at Yungang. This is the one that was sponsored under imperial patronage, dating to the later part of the 5th century, um, probably 450-ish, 450 or so B.C., or, yeah, common, common era, excuse me, not B.C.E. So you've got to think about this. If Buddha lived in the 6th century B.C.E., and now we're talking about the 5th century C.E., that's almost a thousand years after the Buddha actually lived. So Buddhism had, by this point, become quite complex. It has migrated out of India across the Silk Roads, and, um, over, time, and over time and over geography, different aspects of 
Buddhism become prominent in different parts of the world and in different religious practices of Buddhism. On top of that, what you've got here with this 42 foot tall massive colossal statue of the Buddha is the first surviving attempt on the part of Chinese sculptors to render a colossal figure in stone. We don't have any surviving monumental stone sculpture from before the 5th century of the Common Era. There are some historical records that suggest there may have been a couple of colossal Buddhas in the, the 4th century BC or CE, but they are no longer extant. So this is the earliest surviving example we have of monumental stone carving. It has often been commented on by scholars that it seems obvious that these sculptors are not either used to carving such monumental figures or the, and or that they are looking at a variety of non-monumental sources that they're copying. One obvious source and one that we have lots of evidence for because there are surviving examples like in the caves at Dunhuang farther west on the Silk Road are um, paintings and woodblock prints that w printing was already extant in China at this time which is one of the ways in which Buddhism and the texts of Buddhism were distributed to the population. Um, but it seems clear that, and if you look at this Buddha, I think you can see really stylistically what, what the scholars are talking about, that there is such a heavy emphasis on line in the carving of the folds of the Buddha's drapery. If you And that little figure on his left, on our right, is a bodhisattva. That is a kind of enlightened being who, instead of going on to nirvana, has stuck around on earth to help the rest of us become enlightened too. Uh, kind of handmaiden to um, enlightenment for the Buddha. So a little bit like a saint in the West. So here, um, I think you can see, it's clear that, or it seems clear that, and then with the patterned kind of linear background that you have behind the Buddha, that probably the source for this is a painting or a print, a two-dimensional linear form rather than a three-dimensional form seems to be the basis for this sculpture. And that would make sense considering that you can't port these mo monumental colossal sculptures from place to place, right? And that we know that there were texts and images coming across the Silk Road all the time. Uh, another thing th that you should know, of, or another way that scholars have looked at this and said, oh, well, it's clear that they haven't done much monumental carving before, is that you can see that the, the Buddha figure in the Bodhisattva both really retain a kind of block-like shape. You know, there is an, I mean, they're, they're made into these volumetric forms instead of two-dimensional forms, but they're pretty awkward, pretty chunky, not particularly anatomically accurate. You know, I think if you tried to present this in a figure sculpting class at St. Francis, you might get, you know, some guff for having those massive wide shoulders and those hugely thick arms and then that kind of weirdly attenuated chest. Uh, but here again, part of what's going on is that this is an early attempt uh, by sculptors in a region which really has no tradition of monumental sculpture to create a monumental sculpture. There are some other things that scholars have noted when looking at this Buddha that you should be familiar with. The style, certainly, which is this very heavily linear style, um, owing to two-dimensional source material, somewhat awkward and blocky, um, are certainly things that you should know, but you should also know some of the basic iconography of Buddhism that's represented here. So here's another view uh, from the other side of the same um, Amitabha or Varikona Buddha. Here, there are a couple of important features that you will see really in any representation of the Buddha. First of all, those long, those overlarge ears with those elongated earlobes. That is a shorthand for referencing the historical figure of the Buddha. Buddha was a prince, and as a prince, he had been sheltered his whole life, he had been taken care of his whole life, he'd been bedecked and adorned with jewelry, and he um, 
had lots and lots of, you know, heavy jewelry in his ears that over time stretched his earlobes out. In fact, this was, this elongated stretched out earlobe was a mark of the caste or the, the social class to which he belonged, which was the super upper class, because you had to be quite wealthy to own enough gold jewelry to wear in your ears to pull them down and stretch them out this way. So uh, he has taken off his jewelry, but he retained those long earlobes, and that became a shorthand iconography, a little bit like Virgin Mary's blue robe is a shorthand for <clears throat> the Virgin Mary. Those long earlobes are one. Um, the top knot, or that kind of bump on his head that looks like he's maybe pulled his hair up into a bun, this is actually a visual rendition or visual kind of interpretation of one of the texts about the Buddha, which says that once he attained enlightenment, it kind of, you know, you, you could see it growing out of his head or emanating out of the top of his head. So this top knot or bun kind of lump or protuberance that you see on Buddhas and on Bodhisattvas as well, it's called an Ushnisha, and it is a Buddhist iconography for enlightenment, okay? There are some typical postures that you will see Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in. The cross-legged sitting posture is one. Sometimes a standing posture is another. Those are pretty typical and fa facing frontally. So that's pretty typical of any representation of the Buddha with a few exceptions. There are a number of different hand gestures that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas can adopt. And the, the, the generic term for hand gesture is mudra. So different mudras represent different ideas and different relationships of the Buddha to the viewer or the bodhisattva to the viewer. The bodhisattva there on the right of the screen is holding up his hand, his uh, right hand in a blessing gesture, a gesture of blessing, a mudra of blessing. You will have mudras that indicate um, teaching, a mudra that indicates compassion. There's one that indicates meditation. There are actually several. I think there are 25 or 30 different hand positions. Uh, but it's important to know just that the mudra, the concept that, you know, there's not, there's always a reason for the way a bodhisattva or a Buddha is sitting or standing and the way that he or she is holding their hands because that signifies some specific um, some specific meaning, some specific aspect of that Buddha or Bodhisattva. And there's just another view of Yungang. We can't tell what exact mudra the Buddha was sitting in or, or the, his hands were in because the hands have been weathered and destroyed over time. What happened with this sculpture or this, this complex is originally there was a wooden structure and you can see those square holes there uh, right at the sort of Buddha's eye level and then above the top knot or the Ushnisha. Those were to secure wooden poles that would support a roof that covered the, this was a sort of half wooden structure, half cave temple, but that has long since rotted away, so now this guy is exposed to the elements, and uh, his hands have been destroyed over time. There's more iconography I want to point out to you here. That's another nice view of the Buddha at Yungang, and that's a nice close-up view of the drapery on his shoulders, so you can see how it's really linear. It's not modeled at all. I mean, it's not meant to, it doesn't come out as a three-dimensional carving of rippling um, drapery the way you might think of Hellenistic Greek art or something. It's very, very much based on two-dimensional patterned images, and so it's very, very just grooves basically cut into the, the um, garment. A couple of other things to point out here. Those little seated figures that are all around the Buddha, they they are sometimes called asparas. They're just these flying heavenly beings. Sometimes they're represented as musicians. Sometimes they could be bodhisattvas. But asparas are basically just these, these like a chorus of angels around your head. Okay. The other thing is he is surrounded by flames, right? You can see two essentially registers with these stylized grooved cuts of flame emanating from the Buddha. This is an iconography of, and, and uh, oftentimes you'll see behind the Buddha a big flame-shaped halo. Uh, that image of the flame of fire is an, is an iconography that's meant to suggest 
what holiness, enlightenment, you know, um, compassion, all of these things, spirituality radiating, radiating out of the Buddha. And you'll see these mandorlas with flame shapes in them surrounding bodhisattvas as well. As well. So that is just a sort of brief intro to some of the iconography that you can typically see in these sculptures. There's a close-up view of some of the aspinatas, or excuse me, asparas. Uh, close-up view of some asparas. A close-up view of the drapery on the body of the figure, where you can see it's very 2D, very surface pattern, not a lot of interest in illusionistic carving here. And again, that's partly because of the source material and partly because these are sculptors who are only just starting to learn how to do this kind of carving. There's a close-up of the Bodhisattva, and there again, the same things that I've been saying apply, right? Here, Bodhisattva's got the, the Ushnisha, he's got the elongated earlobes, he's got the mandorla with the flames in it, he's got the asparas seated around him, the heavenly beings to suggest this kind of realm of enlightenment, and then also those grooves in his clothing, those very linear patterns meant to represent the idea of drapery, and then a not very per particularly well-modeled or well-constructed um, body, right? There's no real attempt at making a realistic anatomy with those ginormous shoulders and weirdly attenuated torso. Here's just another Yungang sculpture uh, from the Northern Wei period. This one's slightly better preserved because it's in a, it's a, it's a, a um, inside a cave that's more protected. The statues we were just looking at originally would have been painted the way that this sculpture retains some of the, its original paint. So here you can see uh, the carved flame mandorla, the asparas around the Buddha, and then the bodhisattvas in those little niches all painted to be very colorful and very dramatic. And then the, the body of the Buddha itself and here he's in a, a mudra of meditation. Um, the Buddha itself gilded, right? And you have to imagine, this is floodlit by a photographer to take a good picture that gets all the images. But you have to imagine walking into one of these caves that would be lit by candles or torches. And so flickering candlelight on the surface of that gilded statue, um, casting dramatic shadows, causing illusions of movement there with those flames surrounding the Buddha how um, dramatic that would be for a viewer to come and see, for a, a person who is um, coming to pray to the Buddha, and how impressive that would be. We know that the one of the ways that Buddhism came into China and um, spread, especially during the Northern Way, was through texts that were imported, but also uh, one of the other sources or possible sources for um, sculptors of large-scale pieces was this pro proliferation that we see in the Northern Way of small altar pieces, the kind of thing that could be manufactured elsewhere and brought into China, and then some of these are actually probably made by Chinese artisans themselves. So here, this is a late Northern Way altar piece uh, dedicated to the Buddha, This is the Maitreya Buddha, the Buddha of the future, the Buddha who is going to ascend to heaven at the end of time. Uh, the Maitreya Buddha, who becomes a very, very popular figure during this time. And as you can see, some of the things we've already seen are um, going on here. We have bodhisattvas on either side of the Buddha with little flame halos uh, accompanying them. There's a giant flame halo be behind the Maitreya, Maitreya Buddha. And then <laughs> flame halos emanating from that main flame halo or mandorla. You also have other um, bodhisattvas sitting at their feet. And then down at the bottom you have some, some probably meant to be contemporary figures of people from the Northern Way coming to bring offerings to the Buddha. This altarpiece would have been the kind of thing used for private devotional purposes. It's a small-scale version of those massive public works projects that the Northern Way emperors instituted with those giant colossal Buddhas and the 
um, other sponsored caves that were created at Yungang during this time. You can just barely see it in this image, but this is also, I mean, you can see the, you can see the same kind of linear patterning on the Buddha um, drapery. You can see the same um, um, set of iconography. You can just barely tell he's got the top knot or the Ushnisha. He's got the long earlobes. He's got the attendant heavenly beings, the mandorla. All of these things are the iconography and the style that is kind of developing and crystallizing during this time of the Northern Way. Here's another example of the uh, Northern Way of a private devotional image of the Buddha. So here again, you should be able to recognize some of the basic iconographies, the mudra. Um, this is a, a mudra, there are two mudras. One is the, um, the right, his right hand that's on our left that's kind of raised in this, hey, how you doing gesture. That's actually meant to be the gesture of, or the mudra of reassurance. And his left hand, which is on our right, the outstretched hand, is uh, meant to be bestowing. Okay, uh, so in other words, reassurance and giving. Okay, two of the features of the Buddha. And of course, we also have the Ushnisha, the long earlobes. We've also got the kind of patterning, the linearity that you would expect to see on the robe. Um, here, though, it's interesting. This is a uh, sculpture where it looks like the sculptor is trying to start figuring out how to represent the idea of a body underneath drapery. So you've got those curvy hips and then um, a lot and the sort of elongated torso. I mean all these early sculptures tend to be attenuated and linear uh, but you see the hint of sculptor thinking about how to carve a body or how to make a body. One other thing that's a part of Buddhist iconography that is also part of the developing of Buddhism in China is this is a Buddha standing on top of a lotus. It may not look like a lotus flower to you, but it's meant to be a stylized lotus flower. The lotus becomes a really important symbol of Buddhism because it is a flower that emerges from the swamp and blooms out of the muck and filth of the swamp it blooms into a pure white flower, okay? So it becomes a symbol for the way that the Buddha transcended the suffering and um, um, terribleness of this world and achieved enlightenment. And so there, standing on a lotus is a very, very popular way to represent the Buddha. Here's another Northern Way image, and I hope by now you can recognize there's the mudra of um, reassurance and blessing. There are two attendant bodhisattvas on either side of the Buddha. There's a flame mandorla that's populated by heavenly figures. It's hard to see in this slide, but that's um, what's going on here. Um, let's see what else. Oh, yeah, you can recognize the long earlobes and then the Ushnisha there as well. This is a stele that also incorporates some other imagery that becomes popular or becomes part of Buddhist practice. You not only have the kind of manifestations of the Buddha and the stories of Buddha's life that become, or the, the um, teachings of the Buddha that become texts that are important to Buddhist practice and Buddhist thought, but also a lot of apocryphal stories that accumulate over time around the historical figure of the Buddha about um, about deeds that he performed during his life and feats that he performed during his life that aren't directly out of the mouth of the Buddha. They're kind of later traditions, but are meant to, as stories or as fables almost, to try to help you to understand the nature of Buddhahood so that you can attain enlightenment yourself. And those are some of the stories that are being told on the back of the stele here. Um, the upper register tells scenes from the life of the Buddha. One of the, the stories about him is that he um, allegedly was born out of his mother's side, um, so a little bit like a virgin birth, you know, not tainted by the normal process of birth. Um, in the middle register, there is, in the lower register, there are some famous stories from, from his life that are being represented. So this is another way to teach about the Buddha um, 
including on the bottom register, it's a, a, a Jataka tale that we'll meet next time when we look at the caves at Dunhuang. It's a famous story about how the Buddha was out hunting or riding with friends. He came upon a hungry tigress who was about to eat her own young because she was so starving, and he decided that the noble thing to do was to offer his own body to this hungry tigress so that the cubs would be spared. Okay, um, so the nature of abandoning the body, um, giving of the self, things like that, that becomes a really popular story in Buddhism at this time, uh, one of these Jataka tales. So this is on the back of the stele, just different ways to understand how to be Buddha-like. Now, the Yungan Caves are um, worked on for about a hundred years, and then uh, as the way continues and solidifies, by 489, the Northern Way has solidified its empire and it moves its capital a little bit to the south to a city called Luoyang. And outside of the city of Luoyang, they begin building another series of Buddhist grottos, of Buddhist caves. And this is a kind of view from the river of that whole complex of caves. At Longman, there are, and the, these continued to be built for several hundred years, so there are some main colossal figures at Longman. Uh, sponsored by imperial patronage under a couple of different dynasties, and then lots and lots of smaller caves, over 2,000 of them, that were paid for not by the emperor, but by lower-level aristocrats and even like wealthy merchants. At this point, the patronage of Buddhism has spread. So, I mean, Buddhism has become very mainstream, and it has become very um, accessible, and... It also, especially during the Wei and then later on, as we'll see in the Sui and the Tang, with certain emperors, it was a smart political move to pay for as much of a grotto as you could afford at Longmen because that would help to get you in the good graces of the emperor. The emperors of this period emphasized Buddhism as the official state religion and um, promoted themselves as the first practitioners and also kind of sometimes hinted that they may be closely related to the Buddha or they may be, you know, manifestations of the Buddha to help you along to enlightenment. So there's a mixture, again, of political and religious motivations going on at a cave like um, the Lungmen Caves, which is why you end up with over 2,000 of these of these niches of various sizes in which there are Buddhist statues and imagery. Here, this is a nice tourist view where you can see the main, the main grotto. I just showed you some of the side grottos before. There's the main grotto at Longmen that, as you can see, is just massive. I mean, it's a massive complex. And here again, like at uh, Yungang, originally there would have been a wooden structure to help protect and enclose that colossal Buddha, but that has long since worn away, and a lot of the paint that was on this grotto originally has um, been worn off. And there's there's better traces of the paint in some of the smaller grottos, ironically, but this just gives you a sense of the overall scale of the place. Here is that main grotto up close, and here I hope you recognize there is the Buddha flanked by a couple of bodhisattvas. He's got a flame mandorla behind him, uh, lots and lots of flames, and then accompanied by some heavenly celestial beings. What's interesting is that this Longmen cave is carved some 60 to 80 years later than the main cave at Yungang, and we can see hints that sculpture has come a little bit of a distance since its original, the original attempts at at Yungang, uh, and that sculptors have gotten a little more experience with rendering a three-dimensional figure in stone. I think I've got some close-ups here where you can see it really well. Yeah, okay, here's the main statue on the left at Lungmen, and then on the right is the main statue from the Yungang cave, the one from the earlier 5th century. So I just want you to take a second to look there and see if you can see a difference in the modeling and carving of the Buddha in these two different places. Remember the one on the right is earlier, the one on the left is the later one. I hope what you can see is, although the iconography is quite similar, you've still got the Ushnisha, the long earlobes, the kind of beatific smile, the seated posture, 
probably the crossed arms, the mandorla in the background, the um, asparas, the flying heavenly beings, and all of that. What's changed is the style, right? This is a much better execution of the shoulders and torso of a figure that is realistic, right? Now, that's not to say that that was necessarily the goal of these folks, you know, because the Buddha is more than just a realistic image. I mean, the Buddha is meant to be this figure of meditation. In the case of the Longman Caves, he's probably also meant to be really, really massively impressive to all the um, subjects of the Northern Way who would come here to, to um, practice worship in different shrines. Um, but also that, I mean, so that's not to say that, you know, that's really foremost on their minds, but you can tell there has been more experience at handling three-dimensional objects, even though you've still got a kind of linear pattern to suggest the folds of drapery on the Buddha's chest, it's a more um, well-executed upper torso. There, another thing I think is interesting is you can see there are myriad bodhisattvas, some bigger than others, uh, surrounding this Buddha, and the some of them are scary looking, you know, and some of them are nice looking. This is a feature of the bodhisattva, the, the various bodhisattvas take on different aspects of Buddhism or of enlightenment, of Buddhahood, that they present to the um, striving person who wants to become enlightened. One of the things I like is that you can see that there are... Um, suggestions of movement in those figures, particularly the ones on the very right of the screen, and suggestions of weight shift or contrapposto, not true contrapposto, but at least like indications of the idea of movement in space and turning in space, um, which again comes from continuing to have a tradition of monumental sculpture and sculpture in general that means that there's an accumulated knowledge base of how to deal with the figure over time. And there you can see the top knot and the uh, long ear lobes and the mandorla. And there's what I'm talking about. These are two bodhisattvas that are to the left of the Buddha to our right. And there you can see they are much more carved out into space and they have a sense of liveliness and animation and three-dimensionality that simply was not present in those earlier sculptures at Yungang. Another thing that we see at Lungmen is really concerted and almost blatant um, expressions of the political nature of the use of Buddhism at this time. Here is a relief from a wall panel at Lungmen that was originally on one of the side walls of that main cave and since has been removed and then is put into a museum. But it literally shows the Empress or the Emperor and his court, uh, this late Northern Way Emperor in the process of worshiping the Buddha. Okay, the way that this was positioned originally in the Young Gung, or the Lungmen Grottoes, it was like there was a constant, permanent stone processional of um, the court and the emperor marching towards the Buddha to pay their respects. Showing the Buddha, or showing the emperor as always being pious and always be behaving rightly towards um, the emperor. And also, we'll visit this picture again, or this relief again, because this also is one of our sources for what figural painting and figural depictions in two dimensions probably looked like around this time. And here's just more donors. You could get, there were pictures of the um, emperor and empress at this, and actually several different emperors and empresses had these kinds of reliefs carved into the grottoes so that it would show them constantly processing for all eternity to pay, you know, respects to the Buddha. Here, other donors at Longmen also would have these kinds of processions carved in. So this became an important part of the decoration or the iconography of these Buddhist caves at, at Longmen, not so much at Yungang, the earlier site, but here becomes really important to show the people of this world paying their respects and paying homage to the Buddha. One other thing I just want to note is that it's almost a piece of trivia, but you can see that floral decoration running in a band across the top of this relief. And that actually seems to be, and there's a lot of that, these floral bands of decoration around the outside of pictures or around the perimeter of a, a cave entrance. Um, that seems to be taken from 
Indian art, directly out of Indian art. So it's one of these kinds of hybrid things, you know, as you're, you're bringing in um, traditions from outside your region of pictorial representation and melding them with the pictorial pr uh, practices of your own region. So it's a kind of interesting hybrid that's going on here. And again, we'll probably see this image again when we look at painting because these are so two-dimensional and linear, they seem to have some sort of two-dimensional source. And then on this page, I will uh, let you pause this so you can write down any um, vocabulary words that you might have missed. Cinification, I'm sorry I didn't talk about that in this lecture. That's just a fancy word meaning to make things more Chinese. And that's kind of the process that's going on here, is a process of bringing Buddhism into China, adopting it, and adapting it both artistically and in its, um, in its spiritual aspects to a kind of Chinese way of thinking. And that's a process that we'll continue to be talking about. I will see you next time when we'll look at the caves at Dunhuang.